All right, so uh, for those of you uh, that I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Trevor May. I am the BRF in the duck free split technical specialist at Standard Air and Light. Essentially, I deal with everything BRF and duck free split related, whether that is post sale support, uh, pre sale support as far as application and looking at system layouts in regards to BRF systems. And then, of course, um, anything that you guys might need, whether that be site visits or anything that uh, technical support wise that I could support you with. So this class today uh, is going to be specifically focused on rethinking how we look at single phase VRF in residential applications. Now, traditionally, Ductless does rule the residential market, but there's also a segment of that market where Ductless either has issues because it's misapplied or misunderstood, which I think would be a better term to, um, to say that. But essentially, we're just going to look at the product line. We're going to first look at the issues that we run into uh, with Ductless uh, very quickly, just to kind of get an overview on why we're rethinking the single phase VRF. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, deal with ways that we have with the VRF side of things to be able to address those issues, to understand the differences between heat recovery and a heat pump system, because that's often misconstrued on what that means. Typically, they associate the acronym VRF with the large commercial systems that you see on your screen here, uh, the picture for us to the left. Um, and that is half of what we do, but there's also another side of things on the single phase, not in a heat recovery, but a heat pump side of things. It's essentially equivalent to a ductless and has some unique advantages over the ductless style systems on how we manage our refrigerant, which pertains to overheating issues. Uh, and then finally, we'll go in and I'll educate you guys a little bit about what our room software is and how you can use that to benefit you when you're looking at a VRF job. And to be quite honest with you, you can use it with Ductless as well. It is a really um, useful tool for both product lines. And it certainly takes the guesswork out of applying these systems, uh, not only in commercial, but residential structures as well. Uh, and of course, we'll have questions and answers. So I'll try to break this up. We'll go over and we'll cover at least the multi-zone application issues. We'll pause and take a break if you guys have any questions on anything. And then we'll go ahead and dive right into the um, the single phase VRF side of things. And uh, I just ask you guys to go ahead and mute yourself. And then when we get to the questions and answers, I'll open up the floor in case you have any questions. Okay. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. So first and foremost, the multi-zone application uh, issues, which pertain to specifically overheating. So when we look at ductless multi-zones, we think of an application that has multiple indoor units feeding off of one outdoor unit, which is a really unique advantage, especially for older homes or homes that just can't facilitate certain style of traditional HVAC systems. And the way that it's advertised is a little bit misleading, and it might just be my opinion on that. Uh, but a lot of the a lot of the technicians and even homeowners misunderstand how this system operates versus a traditional forced air system or even a traditional heat pump that's non-ductless. Okay, so the biggest difference between the residential style equipment and the ductless splits is going to be how we manage that refrigerant, more importantly, in the heating mode. Okay, so in the heating mode, the EXVs, which are located all in the outdoor unit, none of them on a ductless system are at the indoor unit. Okay, whether you have a single zone or a multi-zone, that stays the same. Those EXVs or expansion valves, they have to maintain a minimum position, okay? And that minimum position is to ensure that we circulate oil back to the compressor so that we're not starving it and it ultimately leads to a compressor's failure, okay? The issue that we run into is, is that all of our indoor units, whether it is a floor console, a high wall, a ducted, a cassette, it doesn't matter. They're all set up and programmed from the factory to run their fans at a low breeze speed. Now, I often get questions, well, why is that? Why, do we, why are we circulating the fans? Well, that's in an effort to try to circulate that air back to the return air sensor so that we keep a nice and tight dead band so we're not getting temperature swings, which is great. It's a, it is a good design, but on the other side of things, it also kind of shoots us in the foot in the heating mode because if you look at the picture that we have on the left here, we have a four zone system Let's just say for the sake of conversation that our ducted unit, cassette unit, and floor console are all satisfied at 70 degrees. And this high wall unit is located in an area with a greater heating demand, so it's calling. Let's just say it's set for 72, like you see on the screen there, and the space is 68. Well, this unit's going to get the hot gas that it needs to be able to try to warm up that space to the set point. 
What you don't see is, is now that these three other units, even though they're not calling, those EXVs have to maintain a minimum position for oil return, which ultimately results in hot gas flowing to all four of these indoor units, even though that one of them is calling, okay? You pair that with these fans running at a breeze speed as a factory set point, and you can kind of do, you know, the math one and one here. These units over here that are not calling are going to overheat their spaces. Now, depending on where they're at, depending on the application, the insulation condition, they can overheat from a couple of degrees. I've seen it upwards of almost 10 degrees. It ultimately depends on an application by application basis, but the fundamental truth remains the same, which is they will overheat. Okay. And this leads to your customer being extremely upset because they spent a lot of money with you and on this system. And of course, you guys being upset because you're trying to figure out what's going on with this system. Okay. So just as a formality, before we really start diving in, these EXVs on a ductless system, in order to maintain proper oil flow back to the compressor, have to maintain a minimum position in the heating mode. We do it more in the cooling mode as well, but the cooling mode is not going to experience the same issues um, that we see in the heating mode just because of how uh, thermodynamics works with heat going from hot to a cold area. It's, it's all essentially about a balance. Now, there are ways to get around this, and this is what we're going to get into next here. So same kind of concept, we're looking at a three-headed multi-zone system. We'll look at the unit in the middle and the furthest on the right is being in an area that experiences similar heat demands. So if you look at the set points, one in the middle is set at 70, the one on the furthest right is set to 69. We look at the space temperatures as being 76 and 72. So they're already overshooting temperature. And you go, okay, well, why is that happening? Well, if you look to the unit to the very top or the furthest left, you'll see that unit in this particular case has a greater heating demand. Look at the set point, it's 72, the space temperature is 68. Just like we were talking about before where we have the one unit that's calling, but does not change the fact that we still have to circulate that refrigerant and maintain a minimum position to get the oil back to the compressor, which overheats those spaces, okay? Now on this slide, it's gonna make a little bit more sense when we actually break it down where the equipment's applied in a residence. So if we look at this application, we'll look at three different zones on a multi-zone system, which to be honest with you is usually what we see. And sometimes they're a little bit larger, but this is usually kind of the happy medium of what we see out in the field. So you have one area taking care of the first floor bedroom, which we'll call zone one. That current space temperature is 72, set point 69. So that's overheating. We look at zone number two, which is kind of the kitchen common area, the little open concept floor plan. Current temperature in that space is 76 degrees. The current set point for that is 70. So that's really overheating. And to be honest with you, that's going to be the most complained about area because honestly, that's the most time that's probably spent is in that area, that common living family area. And then finally, we look at that third zone as being that basement or that renovated game room area. We look at the set point as being 72, but the actual space temperature is 68. Okay. So we look at that zone three as having a greater heating demand because it's below grade, we have a natural cooling cool area down there, okay? This unit calling, just like we were talking about on the previous two slides, is now going to be the culprit for why these units are overheating, okay? That is not an equipment issue, that is just strictly how the equipment is set to run. Now, here's the confusing part. This picture you see on here, I didn't spend hours and hours trying to put it together and make it look nice. This is a generic image that was taking off the internet that any customer or you guys can see. What's misleading about it is a customer, or even you guys will see it and look and go, hey, zone one, I can control at 72. Zone two, I can control at 76. And zone three, I can set at 68. This is a great zoning system, okay? And that's usually the premise that they're sold on is that they are a zoning system, which they are, but there's an asterisk involved with that. Okay. And the whole reason for me putting the slide up here and at least bringing it to your attention, if you haven't encountered it already, is this can be very misleading. So out of the gun, when we're talking to customers, or we're looking at applying a ductless or even a VRF system. It's important to know what the customer's expectations are and also how they expect that equipment to perform. And, and, and our understanding from the technical side of things is how, how does that system work? Because if we're applying something that we're not 100% sure how it works, it's just a recipe for disaster, okay? But just getting back to the basic point of things, 
this is a generic image that anyone can have access to, and it can be very misleading on how um, the customer might interpret that. So again, we look at this, we get to the next slide, we look at this as being that zone three or that basement as being the culprit behind why those two units, in this case, the bedroom and this open concept uh, first floor living area dining room are going to be overheating. And you go, okay, well, what do we do with that? Well, there's a few different things that we can do, not only on the pre-sale side of things, but on the post-sale side of things. Because as you and I both know, we don't live in a perfect world. Mistakes happen, whether they're on purpose or they're accidental, which typically most of the time, they're accidental on there just from a lack of education on how the refrigerant's managed. Okay, so let's look at the pre-sale side of things. So this is gonna be the application side. So first and foremost, we wanna make sure that this equipment is sized properly for the space that it is in, okay? We need to be doing room by room load calculations and not the block load, okay? We don't wanna oversize these indoor units. Our primary goal is to get as close as possible to that final heating load calculation that we're running for the space. Okay. The old rule of thumb is, is always oversize it just a little bit to cover any mistakes. You don't want to do that with equipment. Not only does it cause overheating issues, but it also can cause defrosting issues if it's too oversized for the space. Okay, so we want to get as close as possible to that final heat load calculation and taking the room by room load calculations, excuse me, and not the block load. Okay. Oops. Second one on here is going to be, if there's a space in that system that is well below the smallest indoor unit capacity that we offer, which is our 9,000 currently. Do not install the unit in the space. It's just not a good application for it. We'll have to rethink and reimagine how that space can be used. That's not to say that you couldn't put something in that space or have something to condition that space, but don't try to force something in an application. It's just a recipe for disaster. In that particular application, if you're dealing with something that you have questions on, you're not 100% certain on, pick up the phone, call your TM or your salesperson, call me. You can call Jamie, the product manager. Let us know, bring us in the loop. That's why we're here is to be able to help consult you and guide you in the right direction to make sure that you're minimizing any risk of that system or anything that you can't see that could potentially go wrong and tarnish a relationship with the customer, which of course would tarnish any uh, future sales that you might be able to uh, to get out of them. And again, it's I know this is real basic on here and some of you might be going, well, yeah, that's that's pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised on how many people just don't pick up the phone or shoot an email and just ask the question like, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. Do you foresee any issues? This is kind of what I was thinking for the layout just to get a second input on it to double check yourself. People make mistakes, myself included in that. It's always good to have a second opinion or a second set of eyes on something. Okay, the third one, which is always controversial and leads me into talking about VRF is sometimes if we look at an application, if having two separate smaller systems versus one larger system might make the most sense. So if we back up here and we go to this slide and we look at this and go, okay, I've seen the application. I know the customer's complaints. I know that from Trevor's class that this basement unit is going to be the essential problem with the other units overheating. So what do I do? Okay, well, we lived in a perfect world and back up for the application. Ideally, if you were to break this system up, you would have a two-headed multi-zone to take care of this upper floor area, one for the bedroom, one for this open concept living space, which are going to experience very similar heat demands. There's really not going to be too much difference between that bedroom and this first floor in this application. Then we split that to a single zone for that basement just because of the greater heating demand for it, and we essentially take that greater heating load separate it from our system and now we have a dedicated unit to be able to take care of that space depending on whether they need it really warm or really cool okay now a lot of guys will look at me and go oh well that's great you must be living in la la land because some customers from a price standpoint that's not effective they're not going to go for that i totally get it that's not the only option that we have which leads me into my next segue which is looking at single phase VRF, which essentially is a beefed up ductless system. Okay, but when we're looking at applications, we definitely want to look at, okay, where are my heating loads at? Where are my customers' expectations? And most importantly, is it going to make more sense from the customer standpoint for their ultimate happiness with the product and to continue doing business with us to split this up between two separate systems and divide that load? Or are we going to approach this as a single phase VRF system because they want one central outdoor unit 
with multiples connected to it. Okay. And of course, I kind of covered this already. Just engage the homeowner. This is this is pretty much sales and technical basics 101. And engage the homeowner and your customer. Figure out what they're expecting out of their system that they're trying to put in the home to condition it, whether it's ductless, whether it's traditional forced air residential, whether it's a commercial customer, this stays the same. And of course, addressing any temperature critical areas of the home, anything that's gonna be renovated, any insulation that's gonna be added after the fact that could affect our sizing for that particular area. It's extremely important. And then finally, I kind of mentioned it on uh, point three on there is looking at our single phase VRF system. So in this case, if we're comparing apples to apples, we're looking at heat pump to heat pump. We're looking at our three, four and five ton Toshiba carrier single phase VRF models that for customers that are looking for one centralized outdoor unit with multiple indoor units that avoids the overheating that we see with ductless multi-zones. And we'll dig in a little bit deeper on why the VRF has that advantage and the ductless does not. Okay, but these are going to be the both the, the most uh, common uh, things that we can do um, on the pre-sale side of things that uh, you know will typically address 99% of the issues um, that we run into on the ductless multi-zones. Okay, so we talked about the pre-sale or the application side of things. So let's talk practical, real-world scenarios. The system's been applied, it's been sold. You have an upset customer. You guys are confused and frustrated on what to do. Now I get involved. Okay, so the first one is going to be Okay, we have an overheating system. We know from the previous slide on there that the two units on the first floor, which would be for the common living area and the bedroom are overheating. And the unit that's causing that is gonna be in that basement or that game room area. So how do we deal with that? Okay, well, the first point's gonna be, we're gonna shut that fan speed on our indoor units off after the step point has been reached, which we can done, we can do through our wireless remote controller through our advanced features menu, which I'll get into in a second. Okay, on the high wall style units, that is the only time that I'm going to have you relocate the return air thermistor away from the indoor coil. So that is our 40 MHH, our 40 MAQs, and our 40 MPHs, entry, mid, and infinity series or high tier high wall models. All the other units have the sensors already away from the coils. Now, I get a lot of feedback from guys saying, hey, this is a really poor product design. And to be honest with you, in some cases, yes, I, I do agree. I think that that return air sensor could be in a better location. However, we need to work with what we have. So relocating the return air thermistor away has been proven to be the most effective for when we're dealing with these situations. There are other options such as using the follow me mode and programming offsets on the thermistor itself, which is our T1 thermistor, which is return air, okay? So the issue becomes, and the whole reasoning that when we shut that fan speed off after set point, that alleviates the issue of that fan blowing and blowing and essentially taking that phantom heat, as we'll call it, and overheating the space. But when we shut that fan speed off, that sensor is located on a little push pin that slides right in on the grooves of the indoor coil. What happens is we shut that fan speed off. That doesn't change the fact that we still have to circulate that refrigerant. So think back to the beginning of this class or the beginning of this presentation when I mentioned on there that we always have to maintain the minimum position with those EXVs. Okay, so we still have hot gas flowing into the indoor units regardless of their call or not to maintain proper oil return. Okay, we've shut the fan speed off. Now that sensor sits so close to that coil, we get radiant heat that hits the sensor and now it warms it up to 90, 95 degrees. So we go from overheating to this unit never comes on at all. Okay, it goes from one extreme to the next. So the purpose of relocating the return air thermistors on the high wall style units is to put that sensor in a better location where it can read true room temperature while maintaining to shut the fan speed off after set one. Okay, so that is a dual process that we have to do. And of course I have highlighted in red when you're doing something like this, please just give me a call. Let me know, you know, one, what's going on, what are the issues, make sure we've covered everything. And if we're going to do this process, then I will send you slides over on where you actually relocate the thermistor at and any questions you have on configuring that fan speed to shut off after step one. Okay, that's going to be the first option that I'm always going to try to go after. Um, there are some cir circumstances where I have done the offsets on there. I just haven't had enough of a success rate to really implement that as a uh, the first thing that I'm trying to go after. And the follow me mode, 
it, it's a good temporary solution to essentially work with our troubleshooting process to try to prove that, hey, look, the sensor actually is overheating. But uh, for those of you that deal with a lot of ductless multi-zones, you will notice in the past that the follow me doesn't always necessarily stay in follow me. And that's usually because of one of two things. If you haven't used a remote in a while, I have found that the units will actually just naturally take themselves out of follow me mode and the problem returns. The second one being you put it in follow me mode and that's what you're using as your end solution for the customer. They take that wireless remote and they put it in a drawer or they put it away from the unit where it's not in line of sight, which it needs to communicate. Defaults back to that return air thermistor and the problem returns. So again, relocating the return air thermistor has been proven to be the most effective way to deal with the situation when we're dealing with overheating. Okay, the second one is going to be, and this is not to purchase this device. I will never tell you to purchase a secondary device in order to resolve a customer's issue. This is if you are looking on the pre-sale side of things, the 24 volt interface, which allows a third party thermostat, such as a Honeywell, a Nest, um, any other third party five wire non-heat pump thermostat will take the temperature from that thermostat itself versus the return air as a default when you have this device, okay? The only other thing that you're doing is you're going in with your wireless controller and you're shutting off the fan speed after the set point has been reached. So again, this is a twofer. You either shut the fan speed off after your set point and relocate the return air thermistor for a traditional ductless setup. If you have a 24 volt interface or if the customer is interested in a 24 volt interface and that's something that we can apply to the system, then we shut the fan speed off in unison with that as well. So it's either one or the other, but the fan speed is always gonna have to be shut off, okay? And then the third one is if you have a Wi-Fi kit, there are overheating measures that are built into the new software of the Wi-Fi kits. And I'll be 100% honest with you. I'm personally not a huge fan of it. I see a lot of potential issues, but it is something that we have to be able to offer if the customer currently has Wi-Fi and overheating issues have suddenly developed. Okay, and we'll go over that in the next few slides here of these three points. Oops, excuse me, I must cut them out here. Apologize about that. Okay, um, go ahead and um, unmute yourselves. Uh, any questions that you guys have just on the formalities of the issues that we deal with on ductless multi-splits as far as overheating is concerned. Okay, easy enough. I don't know if that's a good silence or a bad silence, but uh, yeah, we'll keep moving. All right, so we got the basics out of the way with the overheating ductless. Okay, so now we know why we're looking at the single phase VRF as not only just a substitution, but finding its sweet spot in the residential applications. Okay, so you'll notice they bear a striking resemblance to the four or the three and the four ton on the ductless multi zones with the dual fans. Okay, because essentially that's what they are. So we look at the Toshiba Carrier single phase VRF, three, four, and five ton machines. Now I, I put an emphasis on the brand because Toshiba Carrier is the only single phase VRF system in our product line because we have two types, a Toshiba Carrier and a straight carrier. The Toshiba Carrier is able to shut the expansion valves on the indoor units 100%. Okay, we'll get into why that's beneficial. So, just like with a ductless system, at the end of the day, this is a heat pump. The only difference is you have an acronym in front of it that everyone loves to run from or that everyone has uh, fear of or maybe even have a horror story from whether it was misapplied or just something went terribly wrong. Okay, but at the, at the end of the day, this is a beat up ductless system. The only differences on them are going to be the piping and the control wire. But the application still remains the same. It's still a heat pump. It can either give you all heat or all coolant. This is not the simultaneous heat recovery that we associate with VRFs. Okay, so when we're looking for applications for this, we're looking at residential applications, commercial buildings with single phase power, and around this area, multifamily applications are really three great examples of where these systems can shine and they find their stronghold at. Okay, so when we're applying them, we're just gonna focus this on the residential side of things. We want to look at the sequence of operations. So what's the difference between the ductless versus the single phase? Well, 
our EEVs or our expansion valves are no longer at the outdoor unit, they're now at the indoor units, okay? And when an indoor unit is satisfied at temperature, that EEV will shut 100%, which means we're not circulating hot gas in there when that fan's running, which means we're not going to overheat the spaces, okay? It eliminates that residual heat and it also reduces compressor runtime because you have to run that compressor on a ductless system at a certain frequency to maintain a proper flow back to the compressor. While with the Toshiba carriers, if that valve shuts, the compressor essentially modulates down to a frequency where it needs to be at or a sweet spot to find that energy efficient point. As a unit comes on, a valve will open up, compressor will speed up accordingly to get the refrigerant to that particular indoor unit, and of course it will repeat that process. So not only are we eliminating that residual heat or that huge issue that we face with multi-zones, we also are reducing compressor runtime. These compressors in the Toshiba carrier system utilize a rotary compressor, which its sweet spot or its most energy efficient point is at part load, which we all know if you're looking and you're used to applying systems, that's where we live at is part load. We design for full, but we live in the park. Okay, and this is where the system finds its sweet spot at. So we're still doing the same exact thing like we did with the ductless cell systems. We're treating each thermal zone separately. So we are still sizing individual room by room load calculations because you have an indoor unit that is dedicated to that specific space versus having a ducting system where we're taking care of multiple areas. So it still stays the same. No block load, individual room by room load calculations. Okay. And it also comes to fruition as well, where we look at ductless, we look at two small separate systems, say, you know what, that might make more sense from the customer, or we start looking at the VRF where we have one large system where we can facilitate more indoor units and also eliminate the fact that we have overheating with the ductless multi-zone and address that with the single phase VRF, okay? And of course, we need to understand the differences between VRF and ductless operation, which we'll get into in a minute, on how we manage that refrigerant and how this is possible when we have this quote-unquote miracle remedy to deal with overheating issues with the single phase product versus the multi-zone. Okay. The biggest thing that at least that I can see that I've dealt with uh, through my time through the field and then obviously coming on the standard uh, three and a half years ago is dealing with the exposure that the customers have to certain products and, and especially on your guys' side too, the exposure that you have to the VRF systems. Okay. It's just like if you think back when Douglas first started coming out, and mind you, this was years and years ago, it took a while to catch on and a lot of people to understand and grasp that concept. No one wants to be the guinea pig with anything, you know, and to be honest with you, we have a ton of these single phase systems out and they've been proven to not only address these issues, but also be extremely efficient and open up different applications for, uh, for that particular customer, whether it's residential or light commercial areas, maybe they weren't able to get into before. And now they have that advantage with this system. Okay, but at the end of the day, it's just understanding how we manage that and then taking the fear out of it and then looking at it from a perspective like, hey, 30 years ago, Douglas really started, you know, okay, it started coming out, not didn't really catch on till, uh, I don't know, we'll just say 2010s. It was long before, it was long before that, but we'll just say for the sake of conversation, 2010s, it started to become popular. You start seeing more and more of them pop up in residential applications. And now it's essentially the staple. Usually most homeowners or even service techs, when they're looking at a home that is larger, for example, if we look at areas of homes such as in Tor Hill and Highland Park, these older homes that a lot of younger couples and even older couples are rehabbing and trying to bring back to life, Douglas is usually one of the front running options and what they're looking at to address areas of the home that don't have ductwork, or if you're dealing with a hot water setup, something where you really couldn't even facilitate the installation time or the cost of running ductwork. Okay. And then moving on, we want to build the system from the inside out. So we know we're looking for the individual room by room load calculations. And this kind of leads me into what we need to be doing with room selection software. Okay. I'll give you what I do with room. And then I'll also give you my opinion on where I think you could benefit from the room. So any VRF job, whether it's single phase, three phase, big or small, has to be designed either by myself or your direct salesperson, so your TM or your SD. Okay, that has to be put into that software, checked, 
and then it can be exported over so that your salesman can go ahead and quote you a price on the system. You cannot just go to the counter and tell them you want a three ton single phase system with some connecting joints and some indoor units and they're going to quote you that. They can't do it. Okay. Now, what that means for you is when you're looking at a job, this tool is going to be extremely beneficial for helping you actually build it in front of you to visualize how the system's going to work and you can insert piping lengths and it'll give you an output for piping diameters, the amount of bends in the pipe, D rates depending on what design conditions you're looking at. It can print out reports. You can get uh, AutoCAD files. If you wanna go that route, you can get Adobe files, Excel files. You can really export this to essentially have a generalized overview of how you're gonna build this system out. And you can always send it to your salesperson. You can send it to me, we could take a look at it and discuss it a little bit more. And to be honest with you, it makes the process a lot easier because now I have a general idea instead of going in blind, looking at site visits, talking to the sales staff about how we're going to build the system and what we're going to do. You already have something that's basic that's that built that could essentially be tailored for what's right and what's wrong. Okay, that selection software also has checks in it. So if you're not meeting the minimum line set length or you're over the maximum line set length, if you're under the amount of vertical height that we can have between units, uh, you know, from the furthest unit to the outdoor unit, whether the unit below or above those indoor units, it counts for every single formality with the systems and all the intricacies that go with that as well. So to be honest with you, it's something at least worth looking into. We don't charge for it. You can download it for free. And if you're looking at jobs, and even if it's on the ductless side too, it does the same exact thing. It's there to benefit you guys. And it's also there for us as a distributor to be able to help give you the peace of mind to know that these systems are going to derate to this, or the system is going to look like this, or what is my piping diameter going to be? It takes the guesswork out of it. Okay, we'll get into a little demo that we'll do uh, towards the end of this uh, so we can get a better understanding. And then finally, we want to look at this in the same way we did with the ductless style systems. We want to essentially match that load. Now you look under there, it's slightly undersized. It depends on the application, to be quite honest with you, just undersize them. We want to look at sizing exactly to that load. Of course, that doesn't always work out. Sometimes we're a little bit over or a little bit under, but our goal is to not upsize the indoor units, just like with the ductless systems. Okay. Now, with these systems, we can get up to 130% connected capacity. So what that connected capacity means, that is in reference to 100% connected capacity. For example, if you have a three ton unit, you can essentially take and put four and a half tons on that three ton unit. Okay, while I advise against that, that four ton or that three ton unit at the end of the day is only a three ton unit. Okay, when we talk about going over a connect capacity, we're looking at how that load is going to balance throughout the day. So we all know the sunrise in the east, sets in the west. Are we able to balance how that load in that particular space, whether it's commercial or residential, hits that building throughout the day and be able to essentially have more indoor units than we actually have capacity at the outdoor unit? Okay. To be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of going over 100%. Um, we do do it. Um, I mean, it's, it's typically, I, I'm comfortable, uh, let's just say for the sake of conversation, anything over 110% connected capacity, I start getting worried a little bit. Not because I don't think the system can't perform, but I think worst case scenario, middle of July or middle of August, if it's 98 degrees outside, 100% humidity, and we have four tons on a three ton system. Well, that's only a three ton unit. It can only give you three tons of cooling capacity. So I don't know, call me old fashioned, call me a worry wart, what you will, but I like to know at the end of the day that that system's gonna give me exactly what I need it to give me. All right. And then, of course, uh, depending on what indoor unit that you're dealing with, and this just applies to the non-ducted versions of our indoor units on these VRS systems, typically there's no need to account for any losses due to long duct runs and the costs associated with installing them and any leaky duct work, just like we deal with on the ductless style systems. So I know we kind of went through a lot with just looking at the application on this, but when we're looking at this from an apples to apples standpoint, there's really not much of a difference between how we're applying a ductless multi-zone or single, how we're applying this VRF T. It's the same exact thing. Okay, it's just understanding and taking the, the mystery or the, the magic that people think VRF has, because at the end of the day, it's not magic. It's control boards and refrigerant and piping. 
and there's really not much to these systems. It's just understanding them better and getting comfortable with them, just like we did with Douglas years ago. All right, so let's take a little bit more overview with the three, four, and five ton product. So we look at the three ton outdoor unit for the Toshiba Carrier single phase VRF. So if you look on red there where it says maximum number of connected indoor units, you can already see right out of the gate, you look at apples to apples here, three ton multi, three ton single phase VRF. We already can allow you more connectable indoor units on that three ton system. Okay, so that's an advantage right out of the gate. Now we start looking at operation ranges, and this is usually the one that comes up. What are you, What is your D rate at minus 13? At minus 13, we're giving you 75% of the rated capacity at minus 13. At five degrees, we're 100% uh, capacity delivered on that. And we'll dive into some of the D rates on here and the advantages and dispelling some of the myths where we see what the unit's rated to versus what it actually D rates at, okay? Look at the four ton unit. Four ton unit, you're gonna see you have eight connectable indoor units. And then as we go up to the largest size that we have, which is our five ton, nine connectable indoor units on one centralized outdoor unit that doesn't overheat, okay? So hopefully you guys can see the advantages right off of the right off of the bat here with looking at this compared to a multi-done system, okay? And then in below too, if you go wanna take a screenshot or write that part number down, that is the outdoor unit stand um, that will work with this Toshiba Carrier outdoor unit. All right, a little bit more screenshot into this. This just gives you the height width uh, the depth, the weight of the unit itself, but more importantly, the one I wanted to focus on, and this is where we start breaking off in the ductless and reshaping our thinking, is you'll see the factory charge, which is 14.8 pounds of 410A. You'll notice there in red, this does not include piping length and indoor unit type. So essentially what that means is that 14.8 pounds that's a factory charge in the outdoor unit is good for zero feet. As soon as you start piping, as soon as you start adding additional refrigerant charge, unlike the ductless, where they typically are good for up to 25 feet, once we exceed that, there's a certain multiplier ounces per foot that we use to calculate. As soon as we pipe on this, is as soon as we start adding charge. So this will take me back to the room selection software. That's why it's important when you do a job and also why we require us as a distributor to be able to double check everything, make sure piping lengths are accurate, because when you secure a job, not only will you get the installation training from myself and job site visits to ensure that everything goes along smoothly for you until you're able to essentially go on your own and you can have site visits as little or as much as you need. But you're going to get a job report from me, which is essentially an output from the room software that includes your length and your diameter of piping. It's important because, as we all know, that we don't live in a perfect world. Piping lengths change. We need to have updated piping lengths so that we can get an accurate refrigerant charge because as soon as we start piping, we start adding additional. So if that's off, our additional charge is off, and of course you can kind of see where I'm going with that. So that's going to be the first difference between a VRF and a multi-zone ductless system is how we look at additional refrigerant charge. Okay. So we look at the VRF indoor units as having 10 different styles of indoor units. We have our ducted styles. Now, the biggest advantage over the multi-zones versus what we're looking at now is that we have a low static, a medium static, and a high static ducting unit. So low static is 0.2 inches of static pressure. Mid static is 0.5 inches of static pressure. And our high static will range from 0.8 to 1.1 inches of static. Okay, so of course we can facilitate more takeoffs. The smallest unit that we have, which we refer to as our low static duct, is not meant to have takeoffs on it. It is meant to be one straight shot to that particular space. If you are looking for a ducted unit that has a compact setup as far as physical size and able to take care of multiple takeoffs, depending on the application, you are looking for our mid-static range. Okay, and that's going to be that half an inch of static. That's adjustable on what we can set it to to make it match the application. Just wanted to throw that out there because I've had that happen before and it's very difficult to explain after the units been installed. Okay, we also have our under ceiling models, which you'll see right here. Now, this unit is one of my personal favorites. I like it because it's a dual purpose. So not only can it be an under ceiling application, like you see here, where you have all thread that'll thread right into the unit and suspend it, 
but it also acts as our floor console. Now, if you look right above that, this is the true dedicated floor console. Personally, I don't think aesthetically it looks the greatest. That's why I like this unit because it offers that dual purpose. And to me, it looks exactly like the floor console on our ductless product line. Okay. You also have your high wall style units, which you'll see are a little bit different from our ductless units without the digital display on there. But essentially, at the end of the day, they're the same exact thing. Okay. We have our cassette style units, which you'll see at the bottom left side here, which is a two by two design. And we also have a three by three design. Okay. The three by threes offer an outside air intake where you can have an ERV that pre-treats that air and then sends that air directly into that cassette style unit to meet whatever code requirements, uh, depending on what area you're in or what the building requires, et cetera. Okay. The other biggest thing, especially in residential structures, is going to be the bottom right hand unit right here, which is a vertical air handle. And this is going to be a direct replacement for if you're looking at a job where a home has a furnace they're looking to upgrade or replace. Okay. You can offer them a replacement furnace and also use a non ducted system throughout other areas of the home. Just kind of how we look at with the ductless style systems, but the biggest advantage is going to be that they can all feed off of one outdoor unit and they don't overheat. Okay. And again, there's a multitude of other indoor units that we can cover, but these ones here are typically the most common um, that I can at least perceive that you're going to run across. So other differences between VRF versus ductless. So these indoor units do not take power from the outdoor unit like the ductless systems do. The indoor units require their own separate power source. Now, with that being said, all of the indoor units, because of the minimum amp draw on them, can all share one breaker with individual isolation switches to shut them on and off for service. We do it all the time in the commercial side of things on larger VRF systems. Okay, and then of course, the outdoor unit needs to have its own separate breaker and power source. Second one is going to be how we do our control wiring. So we require on these a separate control signal, which we'll look at on the Toshiba carrier as U1 and U2 for that control bus. And we daisy chain from the outdoor unit to our first indoor unit and continue that daisy chain to our last indoor unit. Okay, we don't create a control loop. We're essentially just ganging all these units together and stopping on the very last one. That's the difference between the ductless and the VRF. VRF, we use a daisy chain. Ductless, we essentially do the hub and spoke style communication where port A hooks to unit A, port B hooks to unit B, etc. Okay, and then again, the differences with the refrigeration piping on there are going to be that we do not use the home run style piping, which the next couple slides will hopefully clarify for you on what home run style piping means. We're using Y branching joints to configure piping to the indoor units. So we look at how the units get powered, how we wire in the control wiring, and how we pipe the refrigeration, refrigeration pipe, excuse me, from the outdoor to our indoor units. Those are going to be the major differences between the ductless and the VRF. Okay, and as you'll see on the next few slides, you're going to see a huge advantage as far as the VRF side of things versus the ductless. Okay. Oh, and one last thing as well. Of course, our control options on there, we have our wired or our wireless control options. Now, the other um, difference that I do want to note on here, the only unit that comes out of the box set up to work with the wireless remote control is the high wall unit. Unlike our ductless product, which has compatibility with everything because they have the built in infrared receiver panels. We do have options for our cassettes, for our ducted styles, for the vertical air handlers to have interfaces put in them so that the customer can utilize a wireless control. Or if you look to the left side right there, that is our standard um, RBC57 wired remote control. Okay. So if you are looking at this and you're saying, okay, you know what, that's not the most aesthetically pleasing wired remote controller, we also offer the same thing that we do on the ductless system, which is the 24 volt interface which can take any third-party thermostat that the customer likes, Ecobee, Nest, Honeywell, whatever they're comfortable with, and integrate it in to the VRS system so they have a controller that they like, and more importantly, that they're familiar with. Okay, and that can also set up, depending on what wired controller you have, if it's Wi-Fi, that opens up a whole different gate as far as how the, system, or the customer can dial in and control the system via Wi-Fi. All right. 
And then finally, um, the part number that you see below is for our 16-2 stranded shielded communication wire. This is going to be obviously for that communication bus that I was talking about on the previous slide on there with its associated part number below. That is good for up to 3,280 total feet of wiring. And 99.9% .9 of the time, that's good for all the jobs that we have here. Okay. Now, we talked about the home run style versus the Y joint piping. So if we look at this ductless system, nothing really crazy about it. Typical setup, three headed multi zone split. Okay. So what do we know about this system? Well, we're using that home run style piping. What I mean by home run is that you have port A, you're sending out a refrigeration line set to the unit, it's coming back. So we have that home run style for port A, port B, port C, et cetera. We have rated operation, and note I put an emphasis on rated to minus 22. We know that we cannot braze on these systems. We need to make sure that we're flaring or using press fittings. We also know from the previous or the beginning part of this uh, class that these EEVs cannot shut 100% during the heating cycle because we need to maintain minimum position for proper oil return, which leads to the overheating of spaces. Okay, we look at a total system piping length and we'll just use a three ton for an example on this, of 328 feet between all three of those zones. Okay, and typically this is referred to as the budget friendly option. All right, so typical ductless layout, home run style piping, um, communication wire follows with the, uh, the refrigeration piping to that indoor unit. Now, let's look at the VRF system, same tonnage outdoor unit, same application. So now we have two pipes that are leaving out of there. And now instead of having the home run style, we're using what we call Y joints. Some people call them splitter joints, whatever you're comfortable with, as long as you understand the concept of what they're doing. We now essentially use these splitter joints to split off to each individual indoor unit. So if you wanna think of this refrigeration main piping chase as your main trunk on a ductwork system, and these indoor units where we pipe off to as individual zones that we're going off to, instead of moving air, we're moving refrigerant. Same exact concept, okay? And now we have our EXVs on the indoor units, which can shut 100% to eliminate overheating issues, okay? So what do we look at the advantages of the VRF system versus a multi-zone system when we're talking heat pump to heat pump? Well, we're looking at less overall piping. So if we look back at the previous slide on there, you'll notice you have all those individual home runs that go out to each zone. And depending on how they're piped, you're dealing with a lot of installation time and you're dealing with a lot of material. With the VRS system, you'll see you only have two pipes that leave there that you have to account for that they're either gonna penetrate into the building or into the home. From there, you have Y joints that split off. So not only are you saving installation time, you're also saving on material, okay? We look at these systems as having a greater piping length. So these systems can pipe up to 591 feet. So we already have another advantage over the three-ton multi-zone system that we're looking at a three-ton single-phase VRF system, okay? We still have that same slim compact design, and we offer this in a three, four, and also an advantage over the multi-zone is a five-ton capacity on that outdoor unit with more connectable indoor units, okay? We talk about, and this actually needs to be updated on there, it's 75% efficiency at that minus 13 outdoor temp and 100 percent at five degrees okay the other advantage on this you can utilize a braze flare or press connection on the vrs system unlike the ductless where we look at flared or press the only thing with brazing just please make sure that you're flowing nitrogen in there to prevent the scale buildup which can clog strainers and create restrictions okay but again common sense stuff so if we look at this from a residential application and use the picture on the right-hand side of your screen, you can look at the vertical air handling style unit as being a direct replacement for an existing furnace. Okay, let's say they had forced air. It took care of the first and partial of the second floor. Okay, so we have something to directly address that. On top of that unit, we also have options for backup electric heat, essentially as that safety blanket in case we get a really cold day and for some odd reason the unit is derating or if it's just not keeping up, we have that safety blanket to hang on to, so we know that we're going to be able to condition that space for the customer. Okay, 
Now, if we look at the same application and say, great, we've addressed the first floor and part of the second floor. Now we can look at the rest of the second floor that either doesn't get hot or cold enough. And the third floor, let's just say it's being renovated as another bedroom or an office or a workout area that doesn't have the ability to have ductwork ray into it. We can all connect that off of the same system, one outdoor unit, no overheating. Okay. So acts as a whole home solution, just like the ductless systems do. The only difference is the control wiring, which we look at the outdoor unit. We know we talked about that daisy chain. That's going to follow along your refrigeration pipe, land on your first unit, continue the daisy chain to your next unit, and then finally to your third unit. So essentially, your control wiring is still staying with your refrigeration pipe. The only difference is it's a daisy chain, and now we're using less refrigeration pipe than we did on the multi-zone and saving on installation time. So hopefully it kind of clarifies the differences between what is needed for a multi-zone installation, which to be honest with you, you should all be familiar with by now. And then more importantly, looking at where the BRF has its advantages and what's required for the installation. Okay. So just to reiterate before we dive into the single phase heat recovery, we talked about in the beginning, and I really want to hammer this home, the EXVs on the multi-zone do not shut 100%. They overheat spaces, which, of course, we know now on the pre-sale and on the post-sale side of things for ductless, we have ways of dealing with that. However, if we're looking at VRF from the application side as a way to address this issue right out of the get-go, we're looking at these systems as shutting their EXVs 100% when they're off. Okay, The typical advertising line, I think, for them was off means off, which essentially means when the indoor unit's off, the EXV shuts down 100% closed. So, for example, we'll work from left to right. You see the first cassette style unit, the set point is 72, the space temp is 70. So the system realizes, hey, okay, that unit needs heat, we're going to send it hot gas. So we send it, the EXV opens or pulses. We look at the other two units with a set point of 70 and a set point of 67, both of which are satisfied at their respective temperatures. The system realizes that and says, hey, I don't need to send hot gas to you, so I'm not going to shut the valve off. Okay. And this essentially is where we start looking at true zoning off of one outdoor unit to multiple indoor units with oil recovery. These systems have built in oil recovery and oil management processes that are much more, I don't want to say advanced than what we deal with on the ductless style systems. Okay. And we're essentially looking at temperature of the oil, not so much a pressure to dictate when we need to go into an oil recovery mode. All right, so we talked about the single phase side of things. Now, again, before we really start looking at the single phase heat recovery, I don't want you guys comparing a single phase heat recovery system to a ductless multi-zone. The ductless multi-zone will win every single time. It's like comparing apples to oranges. This is the system when we talk about HR or heat recovery, which has the simultaneous capabilities to heat and to cool at the same exact time off of one outdoor unit. The heat pump does not. So when we're comparing apples to apples in a residential application, we're looking at the heat pump versus heat pump, not the heat recovery versus a heat pump. Okay. So these are the two options. We were the first manufacturer to bring this to the market. I do believe there are a couple manufacturers now that have got wise to what we have done and offered this in their product line as well to stay competitive. So this is going to be a system that takes the notorious VRF heat recovery operation of that simultaneous heating and cooling and now scales that down to a single phase power source for light commercial and high end residential homes. Okay. Now, if you look to the right side and the reason that I included that there is I usually get the question, well, that's great. What is, what is the MCA and what is the MOCP for breaker sizing? Well, you can see it right there. The six ton units MCA is 47 amps and your MOCP is 50. So 50 amp breaker, okay? If you're looking at a 12 ton machine, essentially that is two six ton units ganged together for the single phase. And you'll have the same exact thing, except now you have two 47 MCAs for sizing your wires and two 50 amp breakers, okay? So that information's there. Hopefully that's beneficial to you. And that kind of took out any questions um, from the get go on that. So when we look at heat recovery, we are looking at a three pipe system which means hot gas, liquid, and suction, okay? We look at those fan coils, 
of being capable to provide simultaneous heating and cooling, which is, of course, the name of the game or what most people think of when we talk about VRF. Okay, so when we look at the application for the single phase product, we're looking at like commercial applications that don't have access to three phase power that want to benefit from having the energy efficiency of being able to reuse either unwanted cold air or unwanted warm air to condition other spaces that have building diversity or multiple loads. Okay, and also high end residential applications. This is not going to be for every single residential applications as you guys can probably assume as I started talking about. This is for larger or more expensive residential applications, larger new construction. Um, to be honest with you, I see this being more of a light commercial um, application than I do residential, but depending on what your clientele is and what kind of applications that you're seeing, this can most certainly be used for a higher end residence. Okay, so we know about the heat pumps and what makes up that VRF heat pump. Here's the major difference with the heat recovery systems. And this stays the same whether we're looking at a 36 ton system or a six ton single phase system. The piping is still exactly the same. Okay, we have our outdoor unit. We have our three main pipes that feed into this little box up here. Some people call it a branch box. Other people call it a selector box. Some people call it a flow selector. It's the same exact thing. There's a bunch of different acronyms that people refer to this to, and it all really essentially does the same exact thing. It is a box with a heat exchanger, a tube and tube heat exchanger, and solenoid valves that control refrigerant flow. It essentially, if you want to think of it as a stoplight, it acts as a stoplight for the refrigerant, okay, and it controls where it goes. Now you'll ask yourself, okay, well, what controls the valve on the, in that box to allow refrigerant to either not go to a zone or to go to a zone? The indoor units make that choice. The indoor units determine whether they need refrigerant or they do not need refrigerant. And in turn, that box either opens solenoid valves or closes solenoid valves, All right? So if we look at a typical system makeup on here, so we look at a vertical air handling unit, a cassette style, and a high wall style unit. We look at as our three main pipes on there is a hot gas, a liquid, and a suction pipe, okay? We look at these zones as having different heating and cooling requirements. So you can see here the high wall units calling for heat at 72. The cassette unit is calling for cooling at 68. And the heating is calling for 70 for a vertical air handling unit. All these units are able to have these different varying loads and opposing modes because of the selector box. So if we look at a VRF system and you say, what makes a VRF system a heat recovery? That box is what makes that VRF system a heat recovery. Without that branch box, that flow selector, however you want to refer to it, we are not able to control how the refrigerant flows and essentially share different temperatures throughout the building to either reuse them or to allow simultaneous operation. Okay, so we know that the vertical air handling unit's calling for heat. So the hot gas solenoid is going to open up and allow hot gas to go to that indoor unit. It's going to condense down to a liquid. It flows back on the corresponding line back to the box. Okay, we know that this guy is calling for cooling at 68, so we're going to open up our liquid valve. Liquid valve, liquid flows in, hits the EXV, creates that pressure drop, boil that off. We come now back to the box as a suction gas. Same thing goes with the other high wall unit that corresponds for heat. Same process. Okay, and then usually the question is, how do we how do we allow that where does that refrigerant go how does it flow does it make any sense it does so there's a lot going on here but let's try to break this down so it makes a little bit more sense so if we look at this slide in comparison to the last one so we'll just hop back real quick those three pipes that you're going to see on the corner of the slide are in reference of where your three pipes from the outdoor unit are coming into the box so that's the inlet to the box okay you'll look at your four indoor units that are connected here. You have one in cooling, one in heating, one in cooling, one in heating. We'll take this heating one for an example. Here is your tube and tube heat exchanger or your double pipe heat exchanger, however you want to refer to it. And you have solenoid valves. You'll see SVD, SVDD, SVS. I can get into this and be extremely technical, but I'm just going to make it as basic as I can. The solenoid valve for liquid is either going to open, depending on if you have a call for cooling, or you're going to have one for hot gas. You have a hot gas solenoid, a liquid solenoid, and a suction solenoid because you only have three states of refrigerant. Okay, that valve opens up, 
And we'll look at this unit right here as an example. Hot gas opens up, so it says, okay, you're calling for heating. Allow that hot gas to flow in here. We condense this down to a liquid. We now feed back through our liquid line back into the box. Whoops. And instead of taking that liquid and taking it out to the outdoor unit and rejecting that cool air into the atmosphere like we typically do with a heat pump system when we have an indoor unit heating, the outdoor unit becomes the evaporator. Okay. In this case, you'll notice there's a common header that all three of these pipes feed back to and then go out of where we actually came in. Okay. What we're going to do now is, is that this system over here is calling for cooling. So we have an opposing mode. So what we're going to do now is, is use the byproduct of this zone, which is that liquid refrigerant, and we're now going to open up this valve and feed it directly into the area that needs the coolant. Then we're going to go ahead and boil that off into a suction gas, and forgive me, these colors are not um, accurate to what states of refrigerant. I know it could be a little confusing, um, but you have the suction gas that feeds back into the box, suction solenoids open, hit your suction line, and then feed back to the outdoor unit. So essentially what we have done using refrigerant as the medium is that we've taken the unwanted cool air in the space that's calling for heating and instead of just throwing it outside and wasting it, we're now recovering it. And hence heat recovery. We're now recovering and over to the area that needs cooling and we're essentially using a byproduct of this area to cool this area and vice versa. And that's where we get the energy efficiency from, okay, is to be able to reuse byproducts of specific zones to help condition them and overall save compressor runtime and allow for a simultaneous heating and cooling system. Okay, that's as technical as I'm going to get with this. But in order to really understand the process of heat recovery, it's important you know what the advantages of having the heat recovery are because your customers will ask you whether it's a light commercial, residential, or uh, you know a larger industrial application. They're going to ask, and it's important that you have the fundamentals to be able to give that information to them, to educate them, to make a decision that's best suited for them, not only for their decision making process, but also for you as the installing contract. Okay, so. Same concept as we dealt with with the single phase VRF product lineup, same exact thing. We have our cassette style units, high wall units, low static, medium static, high static units, under ceiling, which is this unit right here, which is that dual one that can act as a floor console. We have our vertical air handler. We have rooftop units, which in this particular circumstance really isn't going to be applicable. It's more so on the commercial side of things, but um, if any of you have any specific questions on that, we can always um, talk about that outside of the presentation on where we can look to apply that. And then the last one on here is going to be our makeup air unit, which essentially is an outside air processing unit, which acts like a makeup air for the space, depending on how you're trying to meet outside air requirements. To be honest with you, you're not really going to probably see this one on a residential application. This is more so in the light commercial and commercial side of things. Okay, but these units are all 208, 230 single phase. We have 10 different indoor unit types, which you see pictured above. They'll range anywhere from, and this actually needs adjusted on there. Some of these will go down to 5,000 BTUs all the way up to 96,000 BTUs. Now that depends on the indoor unit that you're dealing with. That does not mean that this two by two cassette has a 96,000 BTU capacity. It all varies based on what indoor unit you're dealing with. Okay. And then some of these models have integral ventilation and condensate lift mechanisms. Okay, so for example, the cassette style units offer the outside air intake and also have built in condensate lift mechanisms. The high wall unit cannot do outside air and does not have a built in pump inside of it. Okay, you need to purchase that as a separate accessory, whether it's from us, whether it's a specific part number for the Toshiba carrier, you have to get something to manage that condensate or you do a gravity drain. Okay, the under ceiling unit does not have an outside air intake. It does have a specific slot for a condensate lift, but does not come with it. It's an accessory item. Okay, your low static and medium static units have integral ventilation that you can either do through round up through the side or mix it at the return and they have built in condensate lifts the high static unit obviously you can mix that in at the return for fresh air but does not have a condensate lift and again i don't expect you to remember all of that you can always call me with any questions shoot me an email depending on the application that you're looking at and i can advise you on what to do all right 
So we talked about the single phase, we talked about the single phase heat recovery. Okay, now let's look at usually what we run into as far as people choosing multi zones over the single phase heat pump. So this is not heat recovery. We're done with heat recovery. That was just a formality. We're now transitioning back into comparing apples to apples. Okay, so when we look at these systems, both four ton, one ductless multi zone, one Toshiba carrier single phase VRF, we're looking at these units being rated at two different temperatures. The VRF system is rated down to minus 13. The ductless multi split is rated to minus 22. Excuse me. So when we look at this, an often decision is made, well, that one's rated to minus 22. I want to sell that one. Or I want to give my customer that one. You have to remember, you can't look at those ratings at face value. The reason that we have this design software and that they have all this product data with different D rates based on different temperatures is to give you an accurate representation of, hey, look, they can rate it to minus 50 if they really wanted to, but that doesn't mean it's going to be efficient at minus 50. Okay, so let's take the VRF as an example. So both of these are designed at zero degree outside temperature for heat. So four ton VRF system, total D rate or total available heating capacity is 44,000. 514 BTUs. While we look at the whoops, uh, while we look at the individual units on here, so we have two two-ton high walls, they derate down to 22,257. Obviously, two of them will give you the total derate on the system at zero degrees. Okay. Now let's look at the same exact system, same tonnage outdoor and indoor units, same pipe diameter, same everything, at the same zero degree temperature. It's 29,431 BTU. So right off the right out right out of the gate, look at the difference. Look at the difference. But that one's rated to minus 22. Don't make that assumption. You will shoot yourself in the foot every time. Okay. You look at the difference in D rate between that VRF four ton and the ductless four ton. All right. And then of course you look at the same two ton indoor units. Look at their D rate. We are putting more heating capacity out of the VRF system at zero degrees even despite the fact that the ductless system is rated lower than the VRF system. That doesn't mean it's efficient, okay? So it's really looking at the application, comparing apples to apples, not making the assumption based off of a nominal rating, all right? So we looked at it at zero. Let's look hey, at- Trevor. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, most of the time on my applications that I go with my customers, I use the three ton a lot of the times because of the heating capacity is better if I can get away with the uh, four heads versus the five. Yes, agreed. Yeah, essentially the four ton is a D-rated three ton. Um, there, are, there are improvements to that four ton model that are coming out, um, but to stay on topic, yes. No, that, that's typically what I see as well. Okay, so looking at the same application on there, so we looked at it at zero degrees, and now we're looking at it at minus 13. So this is the absolute threshold for the VRF system as far as it's rated. So four ton VRF, same exact setup, two two ton indoor units. We look at the D rate on the four ton single phase VRF outdoor unit is 32,369 BTUs at that design temperature, which is negative 13. Individual indoor unit D rates of 16,184. Now let's look at the ductless multi-zone four ton as apples to apples on this for a D rate. So you can already see the ductless system or the VRF system is outperforming at minus 13 at, the, at its absolute threshold. Oh, and same thing goes with the indoor unit, individual D rates for those particular models. Okay, again, the stress home. There are more ways to look at this. And as Dolph mentioned before, yeah, you can use the three ton on here, but if we're comparing apples to apples, four ton to four ton on here, Yes, the, the, the VRF outperforms the ductless regardless of its minus 22 rating. It's not to say that, oh, well, ductless sucks. You shouldn't have been using it. We've been misapplying. That's not to say that at all. Both of them have their applications where they shine at. You just need to use the broom software first and foremost to help you guide you to that direction, whether you're trying to do it or whether our salesmen are out there with you or myself looking at it and trying to figure out the actual D rate of the equipment and not sizing based on that nominal capacity and seeing what it actually is going to give you. Okay, it's not to shoot one product in the foot. Both of them are great products, but it's understanding and looking at the VRF as a sustainable alternative to the multi-zone that not only meets but exceeds performance. <clears throat> so 
since we covered that on there, some of the things that we can get with Vroom on here, and this will lead me into the demo that I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes. So when we look at this Vroom software, we're going to enter specific design conditions into here, and we'll get into that as I go through the demo. We can look at additional refrigerant charge, which is, especially on the ductless side, is huge. All you have to do is enter accurate piping lengths and the amount of bends. Now, just as a disclaimer on there, they consider a bend, not a long bend around there. That would be a 45 or a 90 degree fitting they consider a bend. Okay, if it's just a long sweep, that's not a bend. Okay, we can create reports to send not only to you guys, but for something to, for you to have to be able to review with your customers. Okay, this acts as a fail safe. We have built in minimum and maximum piping lengths. Okay, to take the guesswork out of it of whether you're actually doing this correctly or not, the whole reasoning for the software. We have outputs for wiring diagrams, both on the VRF and ductless side of things that you can send out to your techs. Or if you're a tech, you can access yourself to be able to take on the job with you. We have our refrigerant pipe diameter. Of course, this is based on the line sets entered. So if over time this changes, that diameter might change specifically on the ductless style systems. But you'll see on there, with the ductlesses, they're typically rated off for pipe size off of the indoor unit that they're connected to. And same thing with the VRF. The VRF's main pipes, so the main pipe HH, which we'll get into in a second, is typically designed for the maximum piping length that you can pipe off that unit so the diameters won't change. These guys will often come up to me and go, hey, you know, I changed by 35 feet. Is that going to change my diameter? Absolutely not. And that's the whole reasoning that they did that, is to say, oh, well, if it changes by 35 feet, and the system's already getting piped in, well, we're kind of screwed. So that's that's why we did that. So that's something that you can ease your mind with and understand that that's not going to change. And then, of course, this is a tool specifically designed to prevent misapplication and provide critical system information, first and foremost, for the VRF systems. That, that was its primary focus. And then the ductless was brought along with it as well to help with that application as well, since essentially, when we're looking at a single phase VRF versus a multi-zone ductless, it's the same exact thing other than a few different installation uh, differences as well. And again, take the guesswork out of it. Don't assume what you're going to get out of a four-ton unit versus a three-ton unit. If you use this picture as an example, get an exact D-rate based on the design conditions that you enter. Whether we're doing it, whether you want to try to get familiarized with this yourself, someone has to do it. Take the guesswork out of it. Okay, uh, so before I pull my screen up for this room demo, I know we kind of went through a lot on there. Uh, questions on anything in, in regards to the single phase VRF heat pump or the heat recovery? I don't have a question, but I will state when you look at doing that heat recovery, that unit is big, very big. Of course. So, yes. uh, you need to find some place to hide it, especially if you do two of them together. Yes, or a residential application. Yeah, and that's why I put the disclaimer in there. And again, just to reiterate it, it's probably not going to be on a residential side of things unless there is a specific place that we have to be able to put the unit where it's not, you know, an eyesore. Okay, any other uh, questions? All right, so let me go ahead and back out of this, pause my share. And bring up this room software. Okay, can everyone see that screen on there with the uh, the blue screen with the white where it's blank? Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So when you get into this room application, can you guys also see the bottom side where my icons are? No, you cannot. Okay, so try to see if I can do a little bit easier share on this. All right, well, I'll save that to when we're done here so I can at least get through this. All right, so when you open up this Vroom application, and just so you guys know, this is available on HVAC Partners. You want to type in V-R-O-O-M, Vroom, into the search bar, and you should get free download. Okay, you have to have an HVAC Partners account. If you don't, then you need to talk to Colleen about that to get set up with one. It doesn't cost anything. When you go into Partners, you want to go ahead and uh, in the search bar type in Vroom. You want to download your one for Carrier and Toshiba Carrier. And they have ones for Brian and other uh, manufacturers as well within the Carrier product line. But we're specifically focused on Toshiba Carrier and Carrier 2 pipe. For this one, we're looking at Toshiba Carrier. 
So when you open up your screen, you're going to see you have a bunch of different tabs up here. You have a home tab, units, tools, etc. Okay, if you're starting a new job, you want to click new. If you have an existing file that either Dolph has sent you, I've sent you, someone from standard has sent you, click on your open and it'll open up wherever you're trying to import it from. Of course, save it on your desktop, then it'll populate into the job, and then you can start looking at it. But for this case, we're starting something new. So we're going to go ahead and click on the new tab on there, and it's going to bring up this project default window. Okay, and this is where you can enter in your name, the project name, project number. Um, none of these are required to fill in aside from your name and the project name, and of course, the date should automatically populate itself. Okay, if you click on your next tab, this will go into the different areas. Now, in this case, design engineering firm or the installing contractor. You guys don't have to worry about this. This is more so from the distributor side of things if we're looking at a plan and spec job. Okay, your next tab is where you're gonna enter in those design conditions. So if you scroll down on here and you choose, we'll just say Pittsburgh. Okay, you'll see it has the generic values uh, based on typical design conditions. Now, if you have something specific on here, like you want to design for 95 degree outside air, you want to design for, let's just say, cooling for that indoor temperature to be 72 at 53% relative humidity. It'll give you a wet bulb, and there's your conditions. You can change it based on what you want to do with the application on what you're trying to size it for. Okay, and then more importantly, with your heating B rates, this is where you're going to get into to adjust your indoor temperature you're trying to maintain at for the heat. And then more importantly, your outdoor dry bulb or the temperature that the unit's going to be experiencing, worst case scenario, what you're designing for. And of course, your wet bulb and then your relative humidity that's associated. Okay, so this is the tab where you can adjust things based on what you're trying to design for and what the B rates that the system's going to give you are going to output. Okay, so once you've made your changes on here, you've got all your information, go ahead and click OK you're gonna get a select system on there. Now you'll see on here, it'll say heat recovery, which we know is the simultaneous. We look at the heat pump style system. So this is the traditional three phase heat pump, not the single phase. The single phase is specifically highlighted as single phase heat pump. Okay, and that is the three, four, and five ton equipment. So for this case, that's what we're doing. Select that, go ahead and hit okay. You'll get your outdoor unit detail. Now, of course, in this case, we don't have 460 volt because it doesn't exist in single phase. So it's only 208, 230, and then you can, you can choose your ton. So we'll just say we're looking at a four-ton system. Go ahead and click OK. You'll get your unit started by your first set of line, and then you get a little blank spot here. Okay. What you can do is if you go up to your tabs up here, you want to look at your unit tabs and click on that. Now you'll notice in here we have branching header. So if we drag and drop that, I don't know why this thing is slacking. Okay, so typically that would show up on there and ask you, I'm not sure what, what is going on with that, but typically that would ask you, do you want a four port header or an eight port header? You either have four ports or eight ports. Okay, so in this case we have a header joint where we can utilize one central point and then connect indoor units to, or Or we can drag and drop a splitter joint or a Y joint. And I apologize, I don't know what's happening with this software. Anyways, you can drag and drop, or you can copy. You right click this, copy, right click, paste. You can add joints in there. Okay, so these are the splitter joints that we talked about as being the branches off to individual indoor units. Okay, so if you have four indoor units, you need to have three. What it is. One, two, three, four. Okay. From there, you can go up now and highlight and put your mouse over this one. It'll tell you a four way cassette and a compact. The compact is the two by two design that we talked about. So let's just say we want to use a compact so we can either drag and drop or you can copy and paste. Okay. So let's just say we're doing a 9500 BTU cassette. And let's say for the sake of conversation that. The other three units are a 9500 BTU cassette. So we're going to right click this, copy, paste, right click, paste, right click, paste. And it just makes it a little bit simpler instead of the drag and drop, drag and drop. Okay. Now, if you have something different off of there, 
and you need to have multiple indoor units of different styles, um, obviously that's not going to work. So you go up here, if you have a medium static unit, take a medium static up there, let's say we have a one tonner, click OK, and then let's say we've got a high wall, we're going to put a 7500, and let's say we've got an uh, under ceiling unit, what we're going to do is a two tonner. Okay, so now we've got a variety of indoor units on here. You've got them selected. Now what you do is if you double click the unit or when you drag and drop, this window will come up. You can choose your tonnage. You can enter in your piping length, the number of bends, and the height in reference to where the outdoor unit is. So for example, if this unit, uh, outdoor unit was on the ground and this unit was on the second floor, okay, it's going to be typically about a 10 foot height that you want to assume for that because of usual design is about 10 foot between uh, ceiling to floor. Okay, and of course, it depends on the application that you have. But this is what you want to enter in there. And this is something too, if you, you know, you, you're like, you know what, I, I don't want to deal with that. I just want to put this together, send it over to you, let you look at it, and then you can tweak it. That's perfectly fine as well. We can look at that. But that is the bar where you enter in your height in reference to the outdoor unit, whether it's negative or positive, if the unit's above or if the unit's below. And by unit, I mean outdoor. Okay. If you look over to the right, you can give it a room name. So if you're going to call this, let's just say the dining room. Okay, we want to call this indoor unit one. Go ahead and click. You'll see there now it's labeled as the dining room, indoor unit one. Same thing for the next one. We'll call this common area, indoor unit two. Okay, and so on and so forth. And you can go down the line, and name them appropriately. Okay, once you have them named and you have everything in order, now you got to start going in and putting in your rough estimated piping lengths. So, for example, if this decides to work with me. Um, um, all right, so typically this will pop up. Top one is piping length. The, the number you see below that zero, that's the amount of bends in the pipe. So let's say we have 35 feet and two bends. Hit enter. You see on here, 35 feet, two bends. Okay, if you double click this again and you said, hey, look, I thought it was going to be 35, it's actually 60. Notice that 5 ace and 3 ace did not change. That will not change. Okay, so please rest assured that this diameter is not going to change. And you do the same exact thing as you feed down this main trunk from your main your branches to the individual units okay now if you ask yourself hey i want to know what my minimum and maximums are where can i access that information okay if you go to the right side of your screen you see there's two little tabs over here units and performance results okay if you left click on the performance results it'll give you your total piping length for this actual for this equivalent all the technical things that we need to know that no one likes to remember right there nice and easy for you Okay, on the right hand side is the maximum, on the left hand side is your current. So you'll see your total piping length is 591 feet, your furthest actual is 328, so on and so forth. Okay, if you have an error on something, this is where you can go to see, oh, how close am I to something or am I over something? Okay, if you look at the bottom side of the screen right here, you'll see your additional refrigerant amount and your total refrigerant amount. So this is with the factory charge plus your additional. This is strictly your additional. Okay, so that's the information based on your line set lines. Where you would want to click at and where you would use to charge that system with additional refrigerant. All right. Now, if you go over here and you want to name this something different, like the outdoor unit, you don't want it called system one. You want it called outdoor unit one or VRF one or whatever you want to call it. Right click it. You'll see on here, there's a bunch of different options. For this particular case, we're going to scroll down to rename, delete out of there, and we'll just call this VRF-1. Either click enter or left click, and now you rename. Okay, if you're going through here and you want to build a couple different options, so let's just say that this is VRF, whoops, I call this VRF-1, option 1. Okay, so that's the first option you want to build. If you right click in the white, so don't hover over this, just go over in the white, right click it, add a new system. 
you can choose heat recovery, which is three phase, heat pump, which is three phase, or a single phase, which we want to do and look at a option number two. So click that. Now we're back at this beginning window like we've seen before. Let's say we're looking at it from a five ton line. Now you got a new system. So click over here, option one. This could be option two. And then if you wanted to duplicate this, you could duplicate that system. All you have to do is right click, left click on duplicate, and there you go. You can copy as many systems as you want to put in there. Okay. If you have too many copies in there, right click it, remove system. And it takes the system out. So if you made too many and you go, you know what, the customer went with option one or the customer didn't go with anything, remove it, right click, remove, and there you go. You're back to your original option and you can just close out and move on to your next job. Okay, so that's the basics of building that. And once you have everything built, you want to go back up to your tabs and click your home button. You'll notice there's a little system check on there. I always tell people before you do anything, before you say anything, before you promise anything, click on your system check. It will tell you that all checks are successfully performed. If there is an issue with the system, it will throw the specific error that is wrong. So for example, if we look at our farthest actual length, 350 feet, that unit is too far from the outdoor unit that won't allow you to do it. Now, if I go back in and put 250 feet, maximum allowable length of main piping off the outdoor unit is too large. It will not let you do it. Type in 100 feet. There you go. You know that's allowable. You can also go up to your performance results, click on that, and look at and reference your furthest actual and your furthest equivalent. Okay. Now, again, it takes into consideration these other 10-foot um, piping rooms that we have as well, not just this. Okay, again, system check, everything checks out. Okay, so now you want to look at and say, hey, I remember you talking about that wiring diagram option. Where do I access that? Okay, so there is a tab right up here in your home. So you go to the home tab, scroll over to wiring diagram and click on it. Okay, this wiring diagram will give you the name of the control bus. So in this case, U1 and U2 connects our outdoor unit with every indoor unit that we have on this particular system. And as you can see, they are in a daisy chain configuration. Same thing goes from the indoor unit to a, an associated wired wall controller. It'll give you the name of it, any groups that they're in, and most importantly, the gauges that you can see that you can use for wire, okay, and the control bus name. So A and B is from indoor unit to wired control. U1 and U2 is outdoor unit to its associated indoor unit, okay? Now you'll notice on here, I said 16 gauge before on there. 16 gauge will cover up to 3,280 of total feet in actual wiring. There's no sense of you guys buying a thousand foot roll from us from 16 and then going out and buying a gauge or a set of 18. The 16 will work for this and it will work for the uh, outdoor to indoor units. There's no sense, it's just, it's more, it's not uh, cost effective. So 16 gauge is typically what we see, and again, I look at the job to make sure that it is accounted for and that it will work. Okay, so this is where you access your wiring diagram. So once you're done with that, you'll go back up to where it says design view and click that. Now you're back to your home screen where your design for your piping is. Okay, the other option is if you look at the centralized controller review, the chances are on the single phase VRF, and even on the heat recovery single phase in a residence, you're probably not going to have this unless the customer just has oodles of money they want to spend for no reason. Okay, if you look at a larger job where somehow this comes into play or they ask about a centralized controller and they want to add it into a proposal, if you double click that, you'll see here, give your type. So we have a backman interface, we have touchscreen controllers, we can connect into iView, Smart Manager, all kinds of different control options. Typically, We'll just use the touchscreen controller unless there is a specific need for something. Click add a line, click OK, and now you'll see there's an interface right here, this little DMS part number. This converts Toshiba Carrier or the VRF language over into an output on a 485 connection to the centralized controller so that we can take the points or the items in the VRF system and display them on a centralized controller with preloaded graphics. Okay. Double click your system, 
you'll see your first system on here is VRF option one. Go ahead and left click that, or you can hit add all. It'll go over in the current system, select OK, and now it's there. As a rule of thumb, hit your system check button. Everything checks out OK, good deal. Go back to where you click on the central control and you'll see it's design view. That's your home, home base. And now you're back at home base. Okay, so that's the basics of just navigating through here and putting a job together. Once you have your job put together, you're going to go up to your tabs. So we've gone through the home, the units, and now we're going to go over to the tools tab. Okay, you'll notice in the tools tab, there's a bunch of different output options. Not only do you have your system check, which I always suggest, click on it, make sure everything's good. Great. You have the option to export Excel project summaries, which is the job reports, which I refer to, which has your piping, your wiring, and also has the information as far as nominal capacities, rated capacity, D rates. We look at MCAs and MOCP information on particular units that you're selecting, all stuff that you need for that installation. This is the option or the tab where you can go ahead and export that into an Excel file. Okay, the next tab over, is going to be your wiring diagram in a PDF format. So if you click that, it'll ask you, do you want to do the piping diagram to a PDF or a wiring diagram to the PDF? Okay, so you can select either one you want to do. There's a little tab up here that's export to Quote Pro. That is not for you guys. That is for our TMs and sales engineers. Okay, so this one you do not need to worry about. And the next one to it for the AutoCAD, typically you guys aren't going to deal with that. I mean, unless you're trying to import something into a design program, you have an option for it. But typically these two right here, you can just ignore. You're not going to deal with those. Okay. Next tab over there is your export equipment document. So if you click that, it'll ask you which ones you want to output. So you have spec sheet documents and submittal documents. So you can have submittals on the job. Typically, this is a role so much of the salesperson to get those submittals in a package together for you and send off when the job is moving forward, but this is something that you can access as well. Um, there are Revit families on there. We're not worried about that one. We're going to ignore that tab. You can export all documents. So this will give you a list, a little screen that you can choose. Do you want that Excel project summary, the piping and wiring, the spec sheets, and the Autodesk, the Revit families? Typically, I would tell you not to do this, but I mean, if you click it, if you don't want this, you don't want that, you can pick and choose on which ones you want to export. Okay. And of course, always double check after you've made any changes, make sure that it all checks out. And that's pretty much the gist of what I wanted to show you. There's really nothing in the display section that you need to see on there. Um, but that is in a nutshell how we're building a VRF system and also with a ductless system. So just real quickly before I transfer back into the presentation. If you right click like we did before where we're adding a new system, hover over the add to new system. Go down to your ductless tab and you can choose a single zone or a multi. Click the multi just for terms of conversation. There's your model numbers and your tonnages based on what you want. Say we're looking at a three ton. Same exact concept. Use your units tab. And there's all your indoor units. You can drag and drop or copy and paste. For a 40 MAQ high wall, select a 12. If everything on here is going to be a 12, you can right click copy, right click, paste, etc. If you double click on it, just like with the VRF, you can name this indoor unit one, you can call this bedroom one, whatever you want to call it. And there you go. You double click on this. And obviously there needs to be some form of update on this because this is lagging the piping, but you guys get the concept. You enter in your piping length and the associated bends, and in turn it will give you an output on there for your line set diameters, which is derived off of the indoor unit. So in this case, half in, or uh, 12,000 is half inch and a quarter, half inch and a quarter, get that to go away. We'll do a 9,000 on there, three eighths, one quarter. So typically they're derived off of the connections on their particular indoor unit, which depends on the time that you're connected. Okay, now, if you have a situation like this, let's just say we're gonna delete this unit. Let's just say we've got two 12s on here, okay? And we don't want to add anything on here. You'll notice if you go to your home tab and system check, 
System one, which is our ductless system, all pipe runs must end with indoor units or end caps. Okay, so it's picking up on the fact that you have two open ports that you need to either close off or add a unit to. So we don't want to add a unit. So we're going to go up to our units tab and you see the little copper end pipe right there. You can drag and drop that. Or you can go ahead and hit this little button, which adds end caps to all the ports that don't have anything on them. Click that. There's your caps. Go back to your home tab and your system check, which obviously it's starting to glitch. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah, if you guys think of something later on, or if you run into an issue, please let my let me know if there's anything I can help you with. Uh, so just bear with me for one second. I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint. All right, everyone, uh, everyone, see that screen? Okay. Yay, nay. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So kind of highlighting what we talked about, because I know we're talking about a good bit of material in a short period of time. Hopefully with this, you can see that it's not that single phase VRF is better than ductless or ductless is better than single phase VRF. Each unit succeeds in individual applications and they both have their areas where they shine bright. However, Single phase VRF is often overlooked because of that acronym, VRF, and people will run from it. At the end of the day, it's no different than any ductless system, whether it's a single zone or multi that you're working on. You still have the same exact boards. The only difference is how we pipe it and how we have control wiring and powering to the unit. And if anything, it's a benefit to you guys on the initial install. So when we look at single phase VRF, we look at advantages such as less overall piping less overall control wiring, which in turn reduces installation time, which is cost savings. Okay, We have more available indoor units, greater piping lengths on the single phase uh, heat pump and heat recovery side of things, but more so geared towards the single phase heat pump. We still offer that control from our third party thermostat. That's that 24 volt interface, just like where the customers and you guys are used to dealing with with ductless systems. We have direct furnace replacement options with backup electric heat. And of course, we have the heat recovery option, but to be honest with you, it's something that I want to cover, but I don't necessarily see being really the determining factor in this. I'm more focused on you guys getting familiarized with the unit on the furthest left that you see there, which is your heat pump, three, four, and five ton, which is going to be apples to apples with the multi-zone ductless. Okay, and again, it's rethinking VRF on how we apply that or look at it in residential applications using the room selection software, reaching out to your salesperson or myself to just look at stuff. I mean, there's, I have no issue scheduling time to look at a job that you think is a really good candidate for VRF and kind of helping you get in your feet, so to speak, on looking at the applications, getting comfortable with them and succeeding with the product. It's not an end all be all product. I'll tell you right now, it's not a product that you can just shove into any space and make it work just like the ductless system. If you have to shove something in a space or try to make it fit for an application, probably not a good application. So don't assume that this is just put it anywhere and it works. It's not magic. You still have to do the load couch. You still have to understand how everything works and get comfortable with it, just like you did with ductless when it first came out. All right. And then we look at the, you know, the tried and true with the ductless, the single zone and the multi zones. You can get rated heating down to minus 22. Again, please be aware of that, that just because it's rated to minus 22 doesn't mean it's necessarily efficient, especially on the multi-zone side of things. The single zone is a little bit different because of coil sizing, but just because it's rated to minus 22 doesn't mean it's efficient. And the room is a great way to be able to compare apples to apples as far as heating capacity is concerned. Okay, we offer the single and the multi-zones, which you guys know with the ductless. Same thing goes with the single phase VRF. You can do a one-to-one -one on a, a single phase VRF, or you can do multiple. That's perfectly allowable. There's no issue with doing a one-to-one -one or multis. Okay, this is looked at typically as the budget-friendly option. Again, it depends on the application that you're looking at and effectively comparing a single-phase VRF piece of equipment to an equivalent piece of ductless equipment. If you compare a single-zone ductless to a single-phase VRF, the single-zone ductless will win in cost every day of the week. 
So again, compare apples to apples. Of course, we have our space saving designs where we have the compact units, they can fit in a multitude of places, of course, considering service clearances and airflow clearances as well. And then the biggest thing with the ductlesses versus the VRF is the home run style piping on the multi-zone systems and the control wiring. Okay, and understanding the differences of how the VRF differs from the ductless, but essentially we're achieving the same result, except the single phase VRF in most applications is going to offer a unique advantage with how we pipe and how the control wires ran to not only save uh, installation time and material, but also address the overheating concerns. And again, uh, just as kind of a final conclusion with the ductless, we still have that third party control, which I'm sure the homeowners like as an option on there with a thermostat or an interface that they're comfortable with. So again, just to you know go over this, just to really leave you with one final thought, it's not that single phase VRF is better than ductless, but single phase VRF addresses particular issues with the multi-zone ductless and also opens up other applications that the ductless may not have been necessarily uh, geared towards or maybe the best fit. It's just another tool in your tool belt to be able to look at a job differently and have that answer for your customer. Um, so that's pretty much what I had for this. Hopefully you guys got something out of it. Um, you'll see on here, I have the Douglas product manager who is Jamie uh, and then my direct boss who manages um, the VRF side of things, which is Rob. Uh, so for technical support application, I'm gonna be your first point of contact. Okay, if for some odd reason that I'm sick, I'm out of office or just on vacation, or whatever the situation may be, the three gentlemen in our service department are able to back me up on the ductless and the VRS side of things and their direct extensions are right there if you want to document that down so you have it. Okay, but if you can't get a hold of me, that doesn't mean that you won't be supported. You just need to call into our technical service department and those three gentlemen can help you out with 99% of the issues that you run into. If it's something major, then usually I get an email or text or a call about it. So I'll open up the floor to you guys. Um, any questions, comments, um, anything, the floor is yours. I don't know if that's a, that's a good silence or if that's a bad silence. <laughs> hey, Trevor, I do need to talk to you after this meeting. If you yeah, don't have... yeah, different related note, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, if you guys don't have, uh, you don't have any questions on anything, I appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. Uh, again, this is recorded. So um, if you want to go back and review this or if you want to share this uh, with anyone in your... Uh, in your company uh, that wasn't able to make it today, please feel free to share it. This is also something that you can review at any time um, just to get a refresher. So I appreciate your time. If you think of something, please feel free to shoot me an email, give me a call and uh, let me know. I'm here for you in any way that I can be here for you. So uh, thank you guys.